The Chicago Tylenol murders were a series of poisoning deaths resulting from drug tampering in the Chicago metropolitan area in 1982. The victims consumed Tylenol branded as acetaminophen capsules that had been laced with potassium cyanide. Seven people died in the original poisonings and there were several more deaths in subsequent copycat crimes. No suspect had been charged or convicted of the poisonings, but New York City resident James William Lewis was convicted of extortion for sending a letter to Tylenol's manufacturer Johnson & Johnson that took responsibility for the deaths and demanded $1 million to stop them. The incidents led to reforms to the packaging of over-the-counter drugs and to federal anti-tampering laws. On September 28, 1982, 12-year-old Mary Kellerman was hospitalized after consuming a capsule of extra-strength Tylenol. She died the next day. On September 29th, six other individuals consumed contaminated Tylenol, including Adam Janus, Stanley Janus and Teresa Janus, who each took Tylenol from a single bottle. All six, the Janus's Mary McFarland, Paula Prince and Mary Reiner, would ultimately die from consuming the pills. Asked to investigate the Janus's death, nurse Helen Jensen, Arlington Heights' only public health official, visited the Janus household and discovered a Tylenol bottle with an accompanying receipt indicating that it had been purchased the same day. Noticing that there were six pills missing, she turned the bottle over to investigator Nick Pishus and reported her suspicion that it was related to the Janus's deaths. Bishops called Edmund Donahue, Deputy Chief Medical Examiner for Cook County, who, suspecting that cyanide may be the culprit, asked Pishus to smell the bottle. When he smelled an almond-like scent, Donahue asked the county's chief toxologist, Michael Schaefer, to test the capsules, and Schaefer's team determined that four of the 44 remaining capsules from the Janus's bottle contained nearly three times the fatal amount of cyanide. Authorities held a press conference advising the public not to take Tylenol for the time being. By chance, the bottle of Tylenol that Kellerman used was inventoried by paramedics. Investigators noticed that the Janus bottle and the Kellerman bottle came from the same lot, MC2880, and Johnson & Johnson issued a recall for all Tylenol from that lot. But when tainted bottles from other lots were discovered, for example, the pills in Mary McFarland's possession were traced to lots 1910MD and MB2738, the recall expanded to cover those lots and any bottle of extra strength capsules from any lot purchased in the Chicago area, making it one of the largest pharmaceutical recalls ever. A multi-agency investigation found the tampered pills to have been sold or on the shelves at a variety of stores in the Chicago area, including two different Jew Foods locations, an Osco drugstore, a Dominic's and a Frank Finer Foods. One bottle had been purchased, but due to an offset not yet used by Linda Morgan, wife of Judge Lewis V. Morgan. In an effort to reassure the public, Johnson & Johnson, the manufacturer of Tylenol, distributed warnings to hospitals and distributors and halted Tylenol production and advertising. After other incidents like strychnine added to Tylenol bottles in California, a nationwide recall of Tylenol products was issued on October 5, 1982. An estimated 31 million bottles were in circulation with a retail value of over 100 million US dollars. The company also advertised in the national media for individuals not to consume any of its products that contained acetaminophen after it was determined that only these capsules had been tampered with. Johnson & Johnson also offered to exchange all Tylenol capsules already purchased by the public for solid tablets. Customs at airports outside the US were asking visitors if they brought Tylenol medicine with them. The tainted capsules were found to have been manufactured at two different locations, Pennsylvania and Texas, suggesting that the capsules were tampered with after the product had been placed on store shelves for sale. The police hypothesis was that someone had taken bottles off the shelves in local stores of the Chicago area, placed potassium cyanide in some of the capsules, then placed the packages back on the store shelves to be purchased by unknowing customers. In addition to the five bottles that led to the victim's death, a few other contaminated bottles were later discovered in the Chicago area. In early 1983, at the FBI's request, Chicago Tribune columnist Bob Green published the address and grave location of the first and youngest victim, Mary Kellerman. The story, written with the Kellerman's family's consent, was proposed by FBI criminal analyst John Douglas on the theory that the perpetrator might visit the house or graveside if they were made aware of their locations. Both sites were kept under 24-hour video surveillance for several months, but the killer did not surface. 
A surveillance photo of Paula Prince purchasing cyanide tampered Tylenol at Walgreens at 1601 North Wells Street in Chicago was released by the Chicago Police Department. Police believed that a bearded man seen just behind Prince may be the killer. During the initial investigations, a man named James William Lewis was accused of sending a letter to Johnson & Johnson demanding $1 million to stop the cyanide-induced murders. Upon his arrest, Lewis told authorities how the person behind the attacks may have carried out the killings by buying Tylenol, adding cyanide to the bottles and returning them to the store shelves. Lewis was also found to have previously possessed a poisoning book and according to a confidential law enforcement document, his fingers were discovered on pages related to cyanide. Lewis denied being responsible for the poisonings, but he admitted to writing the letter, which he said he had worked on for three days. During the trial, his attorneys claimed that Lewis intended only to focus the attention of the authorities on his wife's former employer. Lewis was convicted of extortion and sentenced to 10 years in prison. In 2007, authorities determined that the letter had an October 1st, 1982 postmark, meaning that if Lewis's three-day timeline was accurate, he would have begun working on the letter prior to the first news reports concerning the poisonings. When confronted with this information, Lewis recanted his timeline. Court documents released in early 2009 show Department of Justice investigators concluded Lewis was responsible for the poisonings despite the fact that they did not have enough evidence to charge him. In January 2010, both Lewis and his wife submitted DNA samples and fingerprints to the authorities. Lewis said, if the FBI plays it fair, I have nothing to worry about. The DNA samples did not match any DNA recovered on the bottles. Lewis continued to deny responsibility for the poisonings and died on July 9th, 2023 at the age of 76. Police also investigated a second man, Roger Arnold, a dock worker at the Jewel Osco in Melrose Park, who told officers that he had possessed potassium cyanide. Bar owner Marty Sinclair, whose establishment Arnold frequented, reported Arnold to the police, saying that he had discussed killing people with a white powder and had become increasingly erratic after his marriage had dissolved. Arnold had worked with victim Mary Reiner's father at a warehouse and Arnold's wife had been treated at a hospital across the street from the store in which Reiner bought her cyanide laced pills. A copy of the poor man's James Bond which contained instructions on making potassium cyanide was found in Arnold's home. Arnold was held several times by the police but never charged. In the summer of 1983, Arnold, mistaking John Stanisha for St. Clair, shot and killed Stanisha, a computer consultant and father of three, who was leaving a bar with multiple friends. Arnold was convicted of the killing in January 1984 and served 15 years of his 30-year sentence for second-degree murder, saying in 1996 from prison, I killed a man, a perfectly innocent person. I had choices. I could have walked away. He died in June 2008. In 2010, Arnold's body was exhumed and subsequently reburied so that his femur bone could be removed for DNA testing. Arnold's DNA did not match the DNA samples discovered in the bottles. In early January 2009, Illinois authorities renewed the investigation. Federal agents searched the home of Lewis in Cambridge, Massachusetts and seized a number of items. In Chicago, an FBI spokesman declined to comment but said, we'll have something to release later possibly. In 2010, DNA samples were collected from Lewis and Arnold, whose body was exhumed for that purpose and neither's DNA matched DNA samples found on the tainted bottles. Law enforcement officials received a number of tips related to the case coinciding with its 25th anniversary. In a written statement, the FBI explained, This review was prompted in part by the recent 25th anniversary of this crime and the resulting publicity. Further, given the many recent advances in forensic technology, it was only natural that a second look be taken at the case and recovered evidence. On May 19, 2011, the FBI requested DNA samples from a Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, in connection to the Tynalon murders. Kaczynski denied having ever possessed potassium cyanide. The first four Unabomber crimes happened in Chicago and its suburbs from 1978 to 1980 and Kaczynski's parents had a suburban Chicago home in Lombard, Illinois in 1982 where he stayed occasionally. Hundreds of copycat attacks involving Tylenol or other over-the-counter medications and other products also took place around the United States immediately following the Chicago deaths. Three more deaths occurred in 1986 from gelatin capsules. 23-year-old Diane Ellsroth died in Yonkers, New York after ingesting extra-strength Tylenol capsules laced with cyanide. 
Exodrin capsules in Washington state were tampered with, resulting in the deaths of Susan Snow and Bruce Nichols from cyanide poisoning and the eventual arrest and conviction of Bruce Nichols' wife, Stella Nichol, for her intentional actions in the crimes connected to both murders. That same year, Procter & Gamble's Ecoprin was recalled after a spiking hoax in Chicago and Detroit that resulted in a precipitous sales drop and withdrawal of the pain reliever from the market. In 1991 in Washington state, Kathleen Daneker and Stanley McWhorter were killed from two cyanide-tainted boxes of Sudafed, and Jennifer Melling went into a coma from a similar poisoning but recovered shortly thereafter. Jennifer's husband, Joseph Melling, was convicted on numerous charges in a federal Seattle court regarding the deaths of Daneker and McWhorter and the attempted murder of his wife, who was abused during the Melling's marriage. Melling was sentenced to life imprisonment and lost an appeal for a retrial. In 1986, University of Texas student Kenneth Ferries was found dead in his apartment after succumbing to cyanide poisoning. Tampered anison capsules were determined to be the source of the cyanide found in his body, and his death was ruled as a homicide on May 30th, 1986. On June 19th, 1986, the AP reported that the Travis County Medical Examiner ruled his death a likely suicide. The FDA determined he obtained the poison from a lab in which he worked. Johnson & Johnson received positive coverage for its handling of the crisis. For example, an article in the Washington Post said, Johnson & Johnson has effectively demonstrated how a major business ought to handle a disaster. The article further stated that this is no Three Mile Island accident in which the company's response did more damage than the original incident, and applauded the company for being honest with the public. In addition to issuing the recall, the company established relations with the Chicago Police Department, the FBI and the Food and Drug Administration. This way, it could have a part in searching for the person who laced the capsules and they could help prevent further tampering. While at the time of the scare, the company's market share collapsed from 35% to 8%, it rebounded in less than a year, a move credited to the company's prompt and aggressive reaction. In November, it reintroduced capsules in a new triple sealed package coupled with heavy price promotions. Within several years, Tylenol regained the highest market share for over-the-counter analgesic in the US. After the recall, Johnson & Johnson's subsidiary McNeil Laboratories submitted a claim to its insurance company, affiliated FM Insurance, for the cost of carrying out the recall, a claim which was later denied. A lawsuit determined that McNeil Laboratories was ultimately not covered because the parent company Johnson & Johnson elected not to buy more expensive recall insurance. McNeil sued again in court, further contending that the language of its excess liability insurance policy covered the recall and recall-related expenses. The court hearing that case rejected a claim of liability, stating that the recall was not caused by liability for the seven deaths. It was at best merely related to the seven deaths in that they served as notice to the plaintiff that the Tylenol remaining on the shelves was potentially harmful. In 1991, Johnson & Johnson agreed to settle for an undisclosed sum all lawsuits against it for the original Chicago area deaths. Robert Kniffen, a spokesman for Johnson & Johnson, stated that though there is no way we could have anticipated a criminal tampering with our product or prevented it, we wanted to do something for the families and finally get this tragic event behind us. The crisis management response thought today as a model of corporate public relations is chiefly credited to the public relations executive Harold Burson. The 1982 incident inspired the pharmaceutical food and consumer products industry to develop tamper-resistant packaging such as induction seals and improved quality controlled methods. Moreover, product tampering was made a federal crime. The new laws resulted in Stella Nichols' conviction in the Exeter tampering case for which she was sentenced to 90 years in prison. Additionally, the incident prompted the pharmaceutical industry to move away from capsules, which were easy to contaminate with a foreign substance, as it could be placed inside without obvious signs of tampering. Within the year, the FDA introduced more stringent regulations to avoid product tampering. This led to the eventual replacement of the capsules with a solid caplet, a tablet made in the shape of a capsule, as a drug delivery form and with the addition of tamper-evident safety seals to bottles of many sorts. While poison candy being given to trick-or-treaters at Halloween is rare, the Tylenol incident, which unfolded across October 1982, raised renewed fears of it. Some communities discouraged trick-or-treating for Halloween, and American grocery stores reported that candy sales were down more than 20%.
If you like that, then check out our Patreon, where for just five bucks a month, you get access to exclusive shows like Real Monsters and Playing With Bones with Amy Rose, along with early access to all our mini souls and ad-free access to the weekend update, and it's Alive Alive! Not convinced yet? Well, head on over now and have seven days on us. That's a seven-day free try for all new members. That's It's Alive Alive pod on Patreon. It's Alive Alive! All the guts and go with none of the guilt. See you on Wednesdays, unless you're on Patreon when you get us all week long. <laughs>